Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous day here in the Finger Lakes of upstate New York in the final days of summer 2019. Uh, we're going to head out to what I hope is a beautiful day out in the Rocky Mountains today. I think we're going to the state of Utah, I'm pretty sure, where I finally, folks, have the long overdue pleasure and honor of having a conversation with Tim, with Dr. Tim Garrett. And I am sure anyone down in the collapse uh, rabbit hole is familiar with Tim Garrett's work. Uh, just real briefly, <clears throat> Tim, Dr. Tim Garrett is a professor of atmospheric sciences uh, at the University of Utah. He has he received his PhD <clears throat> from the University of Washington, and Tim Garrett. Uh, he, he is the author of I don't know how many uh, articles, scientific journal entries. This just give you an idea of uh, of the titles of some of Tim's articles. Uh, atmospheric scientist makes decisive ca case while renewables will not be our salvation. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about that. Here is no chance of reducing global CO2 levels without incurring the collapse of global economy. Obviously, I'm going to be asking Tim about that. Um, and how about Tim Garrett explains why civilization is caught in a double bind ending with its collapse this century. And I could go on, but I think we get the idea of what this conversation is going to be about. And Tim Garrett, come on and say hello to the folks, and we are going to dive right into this rousing conversation. Well, hello, everybody, and Sam, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And it is a spectacularly beautiful day here, too, in Salt Lake City. All right. It's a fine day around the country. Okay, we're going to dive right into this. And this is a, this what uh, comes from Tim's excellent blog called Nephologue. Nephologue, I'm, I'm going to just read what you wrote, uh, Tim Garrett, and we are just going to launch in this as you, as you answer your own question, but we're going to dive in with this sentence. <clears throat> if we cease to grow energy and raw material consumption globally, then the global economy must collapse. But if we do not cease to grow energy consumption and raw material consumption, then we still collapse due to climate change and environmental destruction. Is there no way out? So Tim Garrett, answer your own question. What is the double bind we're in? And is there or is there not no way out for us? Hey, well, thanks for posing it as starkly as that, Sam. Um, you posed it, and I'm, I'm just uh, you're going to answer your own question now. Yeah, well, the, it's, I mean, it's, it's alarming to think of it this way, and it's a bit different than the way that most in the environmental field and in the economics field um, think about the link between the amount we consume and what we would ordinarily think of as being the economy. About 10 years ago, you know, just sort of thinking about this problem of climate change and how it relates to the economy, I, I kind of stumbled across a rather astonishing result. It was, a, you know, a very exciting moment in my life, just professionally or philosophically, sort of feeling the pieces of this puzzle sort of fall together. And the way they fell together was to realize that the link between how much energy we consume and where the amount of energy we consume in the fossil economy is related to how much we emit in terms of carbon dioxide, 
which is why I'm interested as an atmospheric science, scientist, that how much energy we consume is not directly linked to the um, GDP, the amount of global economic production by society. That's actually something that's been changing over time. We've been getting increasingly efficient at producing, um, let's say, goods and services for a given amount of energy. As time's gone up, that's been increasing at about 1.5% uh, per year. It's a pretty st steady march upwards. And I explored something that, you know, if, uh, being a physicist is, wasn't actually that big of a leap, but, and I was very surprised to find out others hadn't done it. But I thought, well, maybe, you know, the energy we consume is energy we consume not to sustain just what we make today, but to sustain the activities within everything we've produced as it has accumulated over all of the past. Now, for an economist, that concept would be anathema. But I think for us thinking about organisms, it's a very intuitive idea. If you think about how much energy you consume in the form of food today, well, what is that related to? That's not related to you putting on mass today, it, you know, putting on weight today. It is related to how much weight you have put on through, from growing through childhood all the way to adulthood. So you consume, for example, about two or 3,000 calories per day, right? I mean, and let's say you weigh 200 pounds. So if you say you have 2,000 calories per day, you divide that by 200 pounds, then you get about 10 calories per pound. It's a pretty simple thing. That's just to keep you going from moment to moment to moment, right? Just to keep mm -hmm. circulations going on in your body. But any dieter knows that if you want to lose a pound, you have to stop eating 3,500 calories. It's a totally different number. The two things aren't related. And this is where we can start thinking about the global economy. The global economy is measured in terms of GDP. It is production. Yes, energy is required to produce. We use energy to take raw materials from our environment to produce new stuff. But that new stuff requires energy just to be sustained. We need energy to gain and energy to sustain. And the bigger and bigger we get from all the extra production that we do from year to year to year, means more and more energy is required just to maintain who we are right now. And with more and more energy that is required to maintain who we are right now, the more and more CO2 we emit. And so the only way to just stabilize how much carbon dioxide we emit is to collapse what we think of as being the global economy. Now that's a very drastic thing, but talking about economic collapse would be the only way not to reduce energy consumption to zero, but just to maintain energy consumption at a steady rate. What I found was that there's an actual number that's associated with this. Um, for every $1,000, of wealth that is in civilization, it takes a constant seven watts of energy consumption to maintain that wealth. If you turn off the power, all of the wealth of civilization will collapse. If you turn off the power, we won't be able to make any food. If we won't be able to make any food, we won't be able to consume any energy. If we can't consume energy, then we all die, and all the wealth of the world dies with it. If you turn off all the energy, then all the cars um, grind to a halt. All the Google searches grind to a halt. Everything grinds to a halt. And all the energy consumption that you know sustains the world, um, sustains the wealth, drops to zero. Carbon dioxide emissions drop to zero too. Well, okay, that's great. But then we've collapsed. It's all gone. If we sustain what we have, if we sustain all the circulations, then the carbon dioxide emissions, they continue. Carbon dioxide lasts in the atmosphere to varying degrees 
for hundreds to tens of thousands of years. So if we maintain civilization, well, then carbon dioxide is going to continue to accumulate in the atmosphere. If carbon dioxide continues to accumulate in the atmosphere, then we are going to blow past probably five to six degrees Celsius warming this century. And that's a totally different planet and probably not one we can survive in. So, I mean, this is the no way out aspect of the way I see it is that if we continue to maintain ourselves, we will continue to emit carbon dioxide, just like you and I, we eat food and we exhale carbon dioxide. We can't stop that okay. not without killing ourselves. If, if, if I can interrupt here just a minute, the, the word maintain that, that you're using, it, it, some folks might be misinterpreting that, that that almost sounds like maintaining is just like staying in the place we are now. But you're not suggesting, I don't think you're suggesting that because one of your main points that you have made, and I obviously want you to talk about, we talk a lot about the limits to growth on this channel, uh, but I have never thought about it in the way you so starkly present this. Over the next 30 years, humanity will double the amount of energy, food, and other resources that we use today. Uh, take a run on this and, and explain to us about uh, how the next 30 years is going to have to equal the last, I guess, 10,000 years and, and, and the 30 years after that and about the doubling and quadrupling over the next 60 years and how ridiculous this gets. So take a run on that so yeah. people yeah, understand sure. it. I mean, here's the thing is that, you know, an economist would say that, let's say, a 2.3% GDP growth rate is, they might use words like anemic. Well, let's take, say we take an anemic growth rate. Um, a 2.3% translates to a doubling of our size in about 30 years. So that's, that's really what it works out to is if, you know, if you do compounded interest, 2.3% yeah. per year would work out to about a doubling in 30 years. So if you double civilization size, well, if you doubled your size, then you would be consuming way more energy. And, uh, and this, it's a proportional thing with civilization. If we double civilization size, then it's going to double its energy consumption. If we keep that, that's just 30 years. I mean, 30 years, I mean. 2050. You know, that's not that's not that far off. Really, and you know, I mean, 60 years. I mean, that's you no, know, still within my kid's lifetime. And you know, 60 years would be a quadrupling. So I just want you know, ask anybody to think about well, 60 years. That's you know, 2080. That's still this century. Imagine a world that is consuming in every year four times as much as it is today. Well, that's absurd, and you and I both know it. That that we are yeah. going to hit the wall. It's uh, it, 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 at that extrapolation. Clearly, Tim, I don't see us making it to twenty. At that extrapolation, when you really look at the limits to growth through that lens, I don't see any way we're going to see twenty fifty, much less twenty eighty. So, are we talking? The, are we talking twenty eighty, or are we talking the next few decades? What What is your timeline, and and, and what's it going to look like as we get closer and closer to twenty fifty, much less twenty eighty? Well, okay. So, I think you know there has to be some level of humility among all of us about making predictions of how yeah. well civilization will be able to extract resources in the future and be able to adapt to averse um, e ecological changes. Because the fact is, is that we have done rather absurdly well over the last few <laughs> millennia. And, 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 you know, there are things like, for example, the discovery of new resources of energy 
that people did not predict, and that made all the difference in the world. So in the 1970s, people would, or the 1980s, 1990s, people would not have predicted the fracking revolution. In the 1930s, people would not have predicted the discovery of oil in the Arabian Peninsula to the extent that it, you know, it, it was discovered and has really sustained us to such a great degree up to today. So, I mean, we can't rule out the fact that we will discover the new energy resources that will sustain us. Maybe that buffet that is out there currently for us will not only still be there, but it will continue to grow as our appetites grow by a factor of two or a factor of four. However, one thing to think about here is that a factor of two increase in our energy consumption rate is something that accumulates over time. So if we increase our energy consumption rate by a factor of two in, say, 30 years, then effectively we will have consumed as much from the environment of the next 30 years as we have in the past few hundred. Which is crazy. So we, Again, that's absurd. It, ain't it, it seems absurd. Yeah. I mean, how is it possible <laughs> that we can grow within our lifetimes, we can effectively double civilization and everything in it in our lifetimes in the next 30 years, put on as much in 30 years as we have, let's say, in the past, you know, I mean, things to case, the past couple of thousand. And then do it again and, in the next 30. Oh, and, then, yeah. and then do it again. <laughs> and, and so, and, and the thing is, is that, well, maybe we can, but then the waste products are the things that accumulate in the environment. And then, of course, you know, the ecological sphere suffers because where do we consume from, if not from the environment around us? So, you know, this is just, you know, a question of simple ecological growth. And I think, you know, that these are things that most people could point out, and I think many people do, and for example, with the limits of, to growth work. What my work shows, I think, is that some of the solutions that are proposed as ways out are not, in fact, solutions, and in fact, would make things worse. So, for example, some people argue that becoming more efficient, if, we, if civilization becomes more efficient, then it might be able to decouple itself from the environment. We maintain all the activities within ourselves, but we don't consume as much from the environment, and you know, it's a happy world. Or we switch to renewables, and renewables end up being a salvation. And the way I see it is that both of those things will, in fact, and are, in fact, making things worse rather than better. Well, let's break that down into two. Let's start with, the, obviously, with the, 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 this Green New Deal being uh, bat, batted around. Uh, let, let me get your spin on the Green New Deal and renewable energy. Why? Is that not going to be our savior? And then we're going to talk from after we finish this few minutes, then we'll move into Jevon's paradox and the efficiency. But nuclear, I'm sorry, not nuclear, renewable energy. Uh, what would you say to the Green New Deal cheerleaders that renewable energy is going to save this planet? Well, there's two aspects to it. So let's say in some imaginary world, that we manage to forget the thing that made us exist in the first place, and that's combustion. I don't see us doing that, but let's say we manage to forget to combustion somehow. And we replace all existing combustion-based energy sources with renewable energy sources that take energy from the environment in the form of, say, wind and solar energy. Now, here's the thing that is not talked about in the environmental movement. We use energy to maintain all our internal circulations, and that's a very abstract physical concept, but it could be just something as simple as doing a Google search or going to the grocery store or, I don't know, cleaning ourselves in the morning or whatever it is. All this stuff requires energy just to keep us going on our day-to-day -day business. But... The thing is, we also use energy to grow. This is the point I made initially. Civilization is not made of energy. It is made 
of matter. It is made of stuff that we extract from our environment in the form of raw materials. And that's sort of our, our mode of existence is to grow by taking stuff from the environment and converting it to more of us. You know, if you eat food and you eat too much, you're going to turn hamburger into Sam Mitchell. You know, and this is going to be this. You use energy to make more of you. We use iron ore and copper ore and wood and all these other things to make more of us, including us as population. If we add lots of renewables, that's just going to enable us to do that to a greater extent. Any energy we add to civilization, whether it's renewables, fossil fuels, nuclear, it doesn't really matter. That energy is available for us to extract raw materials from the environment and turn it into the stuff of civilization in the form of buildings, cars, people, whatever you have. So if we use energy to do that, then of course we are in one way or another destroying the environment, either by taking stuff out of the environment or creating waste byproducts that in turn pollute the environment. Energy is associated with consumption. Consumption is necessarily associated with pollution. It doesn't matter whether it's renewables or anything else. Here's the other part of it. And the other part of it is that historically, and I think for very good reasons, um, every new form of energy that gets added to civilization does not replace the forms of energy that were present previously. Perhaps as a percentage, those prior forms of energy, maybe it's wood or coal, they might go down. But in absolute terms, they stay roughly steady. So what adding renewables might do is just simply enable us to consume more energy at the same time that we consume just as much, uh, let's say natural gas or coal or oil, as we did before. What is interesting is that we can look at the statistics for this. It's, it's actually very easy. We can download statistics for carbon dioxide emissions. We can download statistics for total energy consumption by the world as a whole. Between 1970 and about the year 2000, we were gradually, very, very gradually, it was almost negligible, but gradually decarbonizing. We were emitting less carbon dioxide per unit of energy as the years went on. After 2000, following the renewables revolution, that trend did not accelerate. In fact, it reversed we switched into a mode of increasing the amount of carbon dioxide we emitted for per unit of energy consumed. Now that might seem very counterintuitive, but the way I would interpret it is that what renewables have done is enable us to grow civilization, make more of us, we've become more prosperous. And when we become more prosperous, we don't just demand renewables, we demand energies of all stripes, including fossil fuels. And fossil fuels being the easiest to consume, perhaps we are consuming more of those per unit growth than of the fossil, than of the renewables. The rate of carbon dioxide emissions by civilization as a whole is not only continuing to increase, it is accelerating. And the, the the product the products of that, as you were saying a few minutes ago, and, and, and yeah, and, and I share your frustration when I when I listen to the to the Green New Dealers about the, yeah exactly what you're saying. What it's about is the matter, the the, the material resources that we are yanking out of this planet. Uh, it, it is is what I think is it matters more than the energy source that it takes to do that, and it sounds like you're just looking at this from the eyes of um, of a physics professor, and it seems pretty obvious. Is well, I don't. I mean, yeah, is it obvious or not? I I don't know. I mean, the, some of the the physics is. Uh, it's a bit of a mind bender at times. Even for myself, it's 
well, perhaps particularly for myself because I struggle with this stuff quite a bit. But I mean, the coupling of energy and matter, I think, is still fairly intuitive. You don't have to be thinking about physics because, I mean, this is <laughs> this is our lives. I mean. We are organisms just like civilization as a whole is a sort of a super organism. And we survive by using the energy in food and the matter in food in order to construct us. And it's that coupling of energy and matter that enables us to survive and enables us to grow. And, you know, I think just thinking about that idea is, is as useful as any out there. Um, for guiding how we think about how civilization as a superorganism is going to grow. We use the energy to um, convert the matter that we extract from our environments to make us, and then we emit byproducts in the forms of material waste. Um, the dominant form of material waste for us is carbon dioxide, just as it is for civilization as a whole, and also uh, waste heat. Okay, so it's b before I, I want to I want to come back to this uh, superorganism uh, idea in just a minute, but I want to finish up what we were just talking about about the uh, the the. The other side of this equation that we wanted to talk about was th this whole notion of efficiencies and tell us, try, try to explain in ways for us mere mortals, uh, what Jevon's paradox is and how it relates to what is going on in the 21st century and how it could really be uh, germane to what's going on uh, in a few years from now, if you can figure out the language to do that where we can follow you well yeah sure i mean jevons was he was a you know from victorian times and he was um he, he thought very deeply about a very wide range of problems i'm, I'm quite a big admirer of, of jevons uh, and one of the things he became particularly well known for um was pointing out that britain's wealth was limited by its coal reserves and that um, efficiency wasn't going to provide a way out because with every increment in efficiency in the steam engine, uh, coal became more desirable because then you could use coal to better benefit for making whatever was required by Britain at that time, um, I guess to run its mills, for example. And then if that was done efficiently, it became more desirable. And then, of course, Britain would end up consuming more coal rather than less. And, you know, I, I came about that result sort of in a sort of a backhanded way. I was just thinking about the thermodynamics of how systems grow. And I was also thinking about things like, again, a human. If we think about, let's say, a child. Um, if, if a child is able to efficiently use the energy in food, the calories in food, and the matter in food, just so you know, the proteins and carbohydrates and fats and all that, to make the child, if it does that efficiently, then the child's going to grow faster. And eventually that child will become a teenager and it will rapidly deplete the fridge, that efficient child is going to have a much bigger dent on the food budget than an inefficient child that, um, you know, might be sickly and not grow and, you know, even die if it is not efficient. And so, you know, the, without going into the details of the physics here, the basic idea is just if we can efficiently use energy to make the matter of civilization, then civilization will grow faster. If it grows faster, then it is a larger beast, and a larger beast requires more energy just to sustain all the circulations that go on within civilization um, as it is currently, but at a larger size. So again, it's just maybe more trips to the grocery store, more trips to farther fung locations or 
maybe there's more people and all those people require more food. All those things are manifestations of efficiently using the energy we have to take raw materials from our environment and make more of us. If we can't do that efficiently, then we will stop to grow um, as, as rapidly. Of course, we can think about things that stop us from growing. A hurricane just hit the Bahamas. Well, you know, that wasn't good for Bahamas growth. I mean, that was very clearly an inefficiency. It was a form of destruction. And we could think on a larger scale of things like climate change um, through a variety of forms, some that we perhaps can't even predict right now, creating a drag on our ability to efficiently turn energy into material growth. And if that's the case, imagine that the efficiency of civilization will to a point that we will stop growing. And at the point that we stop growing, we might enter into a phase of collapse. So efficiency is a two-edged sword. We could have positive efficiency or, you know, it might be strange for some people to think about it, but a sort of a negative efficiency, an efficiency where we um, are losing more matter from ourselves than we are gaining by extracting resources from our environment. We aren't able to keep up with the damages that happen with things like hurricanes or sea level rise or whatever it is. So that's Jevons' parad a form of generalized form of gen Jevons' paradox, which is that if we increase our efficiency, we end up consuming more energy rather than less energy. Okay, and uh, all right. Uh, again, I could uh, we could keep right on with this line of talking, but we are already thirty two minutes into this. The, the the super organism. I was just reading an excellent, uh, great essay. If you haven't seen it, I think this came out yesterday by uh, William Reese, who in turn was was. Uh, Quoting the the work of Nate Hagen, who I think you're a, a fan of, and uh, basically along the same lines of, of the idea of the superorganism, imagining global industrial civilization as a superorganism. The way I'm reading that, that would make each one of us a little cell in this superorganism. I think Nate Hagen's might have been calling it the amoeba. Uh, so we're one cell. There is all of this stuff. Obviously, one of the one of the furious debates down here is the whole notion of individual action at this point of where we are in the trajectory of civilization. Seven and a half billion of us. Where did this give us? Did this take a a rip on individual action? Uh, as consumer and, and lifestyle choices that we make, being able to affect the superorganism of global industrial civilization. Yeah, I think this is where it gets personally a bit discouraging. It's, um, I think a lot of us would like to think that we can enact some form of meaningful change with regards to these global scale problems. Um, I admit that I struggle deeply with this issue myself. But let's say you were to take the perspective that you mentioned of us being like cells within a larger whole. Um, well, in the first point, you know, the cells are responding to their environment. So whether they grow or shrink is really a function of whether they get enough food and energy themselves. But if we were to imagine, let's say, that one cell by some imagined form of autonomy decides to reduce its consumption in the interests of reducing the consumption by the organism as a whole. Now, that's a rather odd thing to think about. But if the organism as a whole is still continuing to consume as much energy as it did previously, because the food is out there, 
Well, then if that cell consumes less, uh, it's a pretty safe bet that other cells are going to take its place and just end up consuming more. So the way I think about this in terms of civilization is that over time, um, over a lot of time, we have successfully established what I call an interface between us and our reserves of energy. So what I mean by that is we've acquired the knowledge and the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, in order to do things like, say, extract oil from very deep underground and then use it in a very wide variety of forms so that it can be combusted within our cars or our planes or our homes or whatever it is in order to keep us going. We're not going to forget that ability. It's not a, you know, a, a knowledge set that will just disappear, and that infrastructure is not going to decay overnight. So as long as that infrastructure is there, if one person decides, let's say, well, I'm going to stop flying, because I believe that will be good for the climate, and there are a lot of people who are doing this. Then I think the follow-on question is has to be, well, okay, if you stop flying, the resources are still out there to consume. If there is less competition for those resources because you've decided to stop flying, what is to stop other people from consuming more to take your place? And then, of course, someone might counter-argue, well, everybody needs to do it. And that is a fine counter-argument, but I think you have to make a solid case for that being possible, that everybody would somehow starve themselves when the ability to consume the energy is always still there. The buffet's right in front of us, yet we all collectively decide not to consume it. Is that possible? I, I suspect it's not because just from physical arguments, as long as the interface is there between us and our energy reserves, we will consume that energy. If someone wants to make a counter argument that we can collectively voluntarily reduce our consumption, even though we could consume, I think that argument needs to make cogently. Okay, so let's move into the, since we kind of brushed up uh, in there uh, about the buffet. Uh, I like that analogy. So at some point, I think you're in agreement with me that the buffet is not going to keep getting larger. Uh, at some point, clearly, Tim, the buffet is going to start getting smaller and there is going to be uh, competition uh, among us, more and more uh, people for, you know, each wanting a bigger piece of the pie. This is where we get into this whole concept of uh, what we talk about here a lot is, is resource wars are obviously on the horizon. Do you agree d d just with the evidence in front of you that resource wars are clearly on the horizon and uh, what is that going to look like as we get closer and closer to the limits to, of growth? So I think, you know, you're bringing up a key thing here, which is that, you know, all systems, it, it, whether it's civilization or anything, I and mean, I think a lot about clouds. I mean, clouds, they grow, they have their, their glory days, and then they still keep rising, but more slowly, and then eventually they collapse. Civilization is going to do the same like every other system in the universe. Everything grows, reaches a saturation point, and then collapses. That's just, that's just the nature of existence. Civilization will collapse. And I wish more people would you know, sort of acknowledge this within the <laughs> mainstream of economics. Good luck. Because it's, it, econo traditional economic models don't even allow for collapse. It's, it's an impossibility in their minds, and it's, it's absurd. So, you know, I mean, it's good that some are addressing this issue. You know, as for what it looks like and when it will happen, well, we are already entering a period right now of um, 
oh, I, I don't want to use mathematical terms, but you know, where the rate of return on civilization growth is high right now, it's actually higher than it's ever been, but it's no longer increasing. So right now the rate of return, if you want to think about it in terms of, let's say, your bank account is 2.3% per year for civilization. But that's not actually growing any longer. And it used to be growing, and now it's sort of flattened out. So right now, if everybody's concerned with getting growth, then we are competing for growth among each other. If China gets 8%, then necessarily somebody's getting much less than 2.3%. 8% is much more than 2.3. To balance it out globally, we have to, somebody has to get less. So there you have competition right there. But we are seeing that in some places where that competition is not working out very well um, due to things like climate change in places like, say, Syria and Honduras, where there has been drought, people are arguing that this is drought that is driving wars and it is drought that is driving mass migration. And so I think, in my mind, this is a key point that needs to be made. There is a perception out there that somehow the wealthy will be immune from scenarios of scarcity. My intuitive sense, I, don't, I mean, I can't predict what the future is, and I'm not a social scientist. I just think about thermodynamics and try to understand it the best I can. But I think one thing that does come out of the work that I do is that in any system, and civilization is no exception, everything is interconnected. We consume energy and resources as an interconnected whole. So, you know, you and I, Sam, may be separated by a distance, but here you, we are talking, and then you're connected with, you know, your audience who is connected with a very wide range of other people. And before long, it wouldn't take too many degrees of separation, perhaps only six or seven, and you'd reach pretty much everybody in the world. And these people are moving. You know, we see situations now where we have climate refugees, and these people are coming in contact with people who are in the wealthy countries. I don't know how this is going to look. I saw one statistic where if you took um, India, for example, and imagine India had a drought that forced a third of India to move. That's a very hypothetical situation. And then you placed the third of India in the countries that were in proportion to the degree that they were responsible for the increase in carbon dioxide emissions then I forget the exact number, but you would get something somewhere between 100 and 200 million refugees coming to the United States. So, you know, we have a lot of people in poor countries who are at risk of climate change and may have to move because the countries get too hot or dry. Um, I don't know how that plays out. But I expect that the refugee issue is going to be one of the places that it shows up most dramatically in the wealthier countries. Well, that, that's certainly uh, playing out uh, every time you open the mainstream media news. Now, you have said in, in, in other places, as I've been doing my research, I believe, and I want to make this a di direct quote, I'm going to paraphrase, that you, you have said before that you see this, this playing out, whatever the details look like, as not somewhere at the end of the, conveniently at the end of the century where we're all dead, but playing out over the next several decades. Are you still... Is that still your general forecast in the summer of 2019? Well, it depends how resilient we are to climate change. Um, one thing is that, it, well, it's not just climate change that is the issue. There are other issues like topsoil loss that we've become aware of 
we've been aware of for a while. There are issues like declines in insects that we've only just recently become aware of. You know, there's a very wide range of issues related to, let's say, collapse of fish stocks or nitrification of the waterways. All of these things are threats that maybe each one in its own right might eventually catch up with us in a very serious way. Um, but combined, these things are present to uh, and to a degree that the combined risks might tip us over the edge sooner rather than later. I, it's fair, I'm be very hesitant to make predictions about when exactly civilization might tip into a phase of collapse because, and, the re, and I'll tell you the reason why. I mean, we are polluting to an accelerating degree. I mean, this, this isn't just a matter of question of stabilization. The CO2 that we are polluting with is just one component of the total pollution that we are doing or the total destruction of the environment that we're doing. All these things are combined. However, you can imagine a situation that we discover new sources of energy that enable us to overcome in some meager way of existence, and I don't know what that existence looks like, but some meager way of existence and that enables us to sustain ourselves despite a dramatically reduced quality of environment. And that is something that is difficult to predict because there is always the element of the unknown unknowns. There may be sources of energy, let's say in the Arctic, that the Arctic could, for example, reveal massive new sources of oil that are easily on par with those in Saudi Arabia that we simply don't know about right now. And that would enable us to survive well past a dramatically reduced um, quality of environment in one way or another. Of course, you know, eventually, you know, with every success of ratcheting up of our ability to sustain ourselves, we further accelerate the environmental destruction. Eventually it catches up with us. I, the, for the reason I pointed out, I still suspect that this is all going to come to head sooner or later this century, simply because of the feature of exponential growth. We are already in trouble if we double our consumption in just 30 years, quadruple it in 60 years. Well, I don't, it, it's something has to give. Uh, and, and I guess the big question is, what is that something? Do you, do you have, uh, what is your idea of the something that is going to give our, well, obviously civilization and the, just, is, is that the something that you're implying? Okay. Well, well, so there's something that I, I could provide a conjecture on again, on the details, I. I'm, I'm hesitant to do this because it's just, it's just not, you know, the details are, are hard to imagine with any degree of fidelity. But let's say we get to a point where um, the collapse happens and the collapse happens in a way that we are no longer able to consume as much energy as we were before. This is how I would define collapse, is that our capacity to sustain ourselves enters a phase of decline. We consume less energy, but we still have all the stuff that we built up before that is hungry for more energy that is still with us. If we cannot consume as much energy to support all of that, well then yeah, there's going to be a fight for what energy remains. We will see, I think there are basic physical predictions that in the absence of sufficient energy, that we will see um, an increase in, well, for lack of a better word, tribalism. Like there, there will be a fracturing of the cohesion that requires energy to maintain that currently connects us all. If there's a fracturing of that cohesion, then you can imagine perhaps more isolated states, um, a breakup of, let's say, whatever treaties bind us globally, and then, you know, I hesitate to, you know, make this 
extrapolation. But, you know, of course, one would easily imagine that would lead to um, situations like war. Uh, 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 okay, situations like situations like war. Yeah, I, that that's a, that 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 is a very diplomatic way of uh, of putting it, Tim. I, I again, I wish I had sent you the, this essay by William Reese that I read this morning. The way he describes it, more from an ecologist point of view than a physics uh, guy's point of view. He, he says that humanity is presently in what he calls the apex of its plague phase. And that from, an ecolo from a population ecologist, you know, graphing humans to other well-researched uh, boom and bust cycles, that we are clearly at what he calls uh, the, our plague phase. Does that sit right with you? Would you say that is our, our place in the continuum, in the ecological continuum? Um, yeah, I have a lot of respect for what ecologists are doing in this area of research. I'm actually putting together a group that's focusing on thinking about collapse issues. And the bulk of the group are, is people with um, backgrounds in ecology particularly mathematical ecology, but thinking about system dynamics, about how systems grow and, and eventually tip over to collapse. I think there's one aspect that is a bit distinctive about humanity that sets it apart from other ecological systems, and that is that we have accessed um, food resources in the forms of fossil fuels that are simply not available to any other creatures on the planet and are available to an unknown degree. The f extent to which fossil fuels are available is difficult to predict. So, yeah, we are plagued. Well, that might be quite clear, but how close we are to running out of the food that sustains us is, in my mind, a bit of an unknown. People have made predictions of things like peak oil many times in the past, and they they got it wrong, partly because of this unknown unknowns issue, that we have stumbled into new resources of oil in, one, in varying degrees of quality that have enabled us to just go gangbusters time after time after time. The first one was perhaps, that big one was around 1750, when Britain discovered coal um, near the surface on the River Tyne. If it weren't for that, we probably wouldn't all be speaking English today. Britain took over the world. They got there first. But then there was another big jump in 1880, um, when coal took off in Europe, and also some um, anthracite in the U.S. And then there was another huge discovery in 1950, with the Aguar oil field in Saudi Arabia. And in each of these situations, you can see in the march of civilization, these massive leaps forward, these rushes forward, where we you know, accelerate ourselves into much higher populations and much higher levels of technological sophistication. I don't feel totally comfortable predicting that we won't be able to do that again. What seems to be different this time is that the waste byproducts are global at this stage, and we don't have another planet, of course. So when we are looking at waste byproducts in the form of carbon dioxide, for example, that just won't go away for thousands of years in their entirety, then every single successive leap forward may be great in the short term to wonderful for everyone invested on the stock market, but in the longer term, they will inevitably drive things to work to collapse by making the planet less habitable. I think this is going to all come to head this century, but I don't want to make a prediction any more refined than that. Okay, well, we are 55 minutes into this, and I usually have my, my regular ending, which I'm not going to have time for today. 
because 55 minutes into this, I still have not heard the answer to your question. Is there no way out? There's no way out. There you go. There is no way out for any system, <laughs> but there is no way out, most certainly for us. Either we collapse this century to prevent continued destruction of the environment and emissions of carbon dioxide, or we continue the way we have and the increased concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the other um, uh, degrees of destruction of the environment by other means will lead to our collapse. Okay, so maybe I do have time real quick. If you're familiar with my uh, podcast, I always end on this note. If you were not talking to Sam Mitchell for one hour, you actually had the mainstream media sticking a microphone in your face, and you have 60 seconds to give the Tim Garrett message to humanity in the waning days of the summer of 2019 to wrap this up. What would those 60 seconds sound like? We cannot decouple the economy from the continued need to consume energy. As we consume more and more energy, we will continue to consume more and more matter from the environment and emit more carbon dioxide into our air. We must either collapse this century in order to stop this process of increasing the planet temperatures or the planetary temperatures will continue to rise to such a degree that we will no longer be able to consume energy because global warming will become severe enough that the destruction of civilization by things like sea level rise, rising temperatures and drought will prevent us from being able to continue as a civilization. Okay, and with that, Tim Garrett, I stick around for a minute after we wrap this up, but uh, I, I, I did not hear a whole lot. We never got to the part of the hopium and the optimism, but that's going to be a whole nother subject of discussion. How you, as a as a father and a and a professor of young people, continue to remain optimistic and all of that. That's a whole nother discussion for another day because global civilization is ready to collapse on my camera here in two minutes. So one more time, Tim Garrett, we can find more of your work over on, what is the name of your, the, give us that word. Oh, well, there's a, my blog. I'm also on Twitter too. Um, the blog I have is called Nephilog, and it's spelled N-E-P-H-O-L-O-G-U-E. -E. Okay, I will put the link to that. From people, I, you need to go over there and get on that blog and open your eyes. But we have got to go. So, Tim Garrett, we really appreciate you taking an hour out of your busy schedule to talk to us. And more importantly, we appreciate the the job you are doing to bring this news to a planet who needs to hear some truth and keep up the good work. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Sam. Bye, guys.